Welcome everybody to the Brian Fergrossi podcast. That's me. So great to have Allison share with us. Talking about her, her new book, second book, you were on previously for your former book, Millennial's Guide to Changing the World. And now your new book, which, when does it come out? Uh, I'm not quite sure yet, but I'm hoping before the November election for kind of time. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And you said this is the first podcast that you've uh, on this book? Yeah, this is my done? first time publicly speaking about it. Fantastic. So an exclusive for now. Um, so I have one technical question before like we go into the, the book itself, which is like, I'm interested in your your process, your creative process for like writing and like what do you have a set time every day that you would work on the book or how would that work for you? Um, well, I should, but I don't. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely going to be moving into a more structured writing schedule. Mm -hmm. But for this book in particular, it's been a um, kind of like inner battle on whether or not I should release it. So for me, my process has mainly been like getting all the different parts of myself aligned. Mm deciding that I'm actually going to do this professionally and invest all mm -hmm. that is required to like get a book out and mm -hmm. message across and be the, you know, the voice of that message. So mm -hmm. that's really what the majority of my energy has been thus far, but I do have a proposal written and chapters mm -hmm. written, um, mm -hmm. which I showed my agent and started getting, feedback on the concept and actually did a bunch of tweaking uh based on that feedback okay and you've been conflicted because is it because you feel like there may be some like it's controversial or there may be some backlash or yeah definitely <laughs> yeah and then also like my family alliances and needing to get their support as well um so that was also like a big kind of I guess you could say like healing was that my parents are fully supportive of me putting out this book, which mm -hmm. deals with the, the pandemic and politics and public health policy. And that's um very much their professional wheelhouse. So that has been, that has been like, that was like the final deciding factor. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to this if I, uh, if it's going to like, you know, tear apart my family. So, yeah. Well, let's, I think now we should artic articulate, explain what the book is about, and then also who your parents are since you put that forward as well. Yeah. So the book kind of, I started writing it during the pandemic when we were mm -hmm. all in lockdown mm -hmm. just because I like how I sense make is through writing. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what was really going on mm -hmm. uh, as I think many of us were, and I think many of us had pretty profound paradigm shifts politically, given the research and the information that yeah. we gathered, you know, um, I feel like the left people who once identified more as like leftist and their policy views, like now became more moderate, more centrist, started to see a uh, logic behind some conservative ideals. Um, and yeah, so I was just writing and exploring all the different things that were happening from the BLM protests to the anarchists creating, you know, uh, cities inside of, where was it, in Portland and Seattle. Seattle yeah. So like I, what I saw was like all these different uh, polarizations inside of society and belief systems like erupting and the biggest kind of fight was around constitutional rights and um and even you know a big debate around the scientific method and the scientific process and kind of like this epistemological ab absurdism that has arisen where if science is the way that we have traditionally been able to look and find like objective truths objective mm -hmm. patterns in the world um you know, like, are are there divided loyalties there? Uh, like, how does the actual industry of science work? And then, you know, because of my parents, my father, and actually most of my dad's side of the entire family has worked on vaccine technology 
and has developed like many different types of vaccines. Um, my father works very closely with Tony Fauci. Um, my mother works very closely with Bill Gates. They're both pretty high up in public health policy. So there was also this deep um, split inside of me that I needed to reconcile around you know, essentially like global protests happening over my parents' work and being with my parents and like seeing how desperately they were trying to save lives. And, um, and so that's, that's a part of it, but also a huge figure in the book is Trump and how his presidency and how the media has portrayed him, um, two very different lights has created almost like a culture war inside of America mm -hmm. and how this upcoming election, it seems like things have really calmed down, but I'm, I'm imagining they might uh, start to get roused up again if he makes it, you know, into the final election, which he probably will. Right. So just him alone as a figure brings up so much pain for people and it seems to me like the split is around the right wing and they can be quite radical but you know them thinking that he is a somewhat like messiah of sorts like draining the swamp mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and tackling governmental corruption as this outsider and that um there are these larger conspiracies happening inside of America to take away our rights, bring us into this globalist communist, um, you know, dystopia. And he's the one fighting it. Also like China is a huge figure here around, uh, are we, you know, under attack from China? What are Biden's alliances with China? And then with the left, there's all this um, concern over structural and institutional racism, sexism, um, moving towards socialist interventions mm -hmm. to ameliorate the um the like the struggles the economic struggles that the mm -hmm. average american has uh in america I so think, i think homophobia and transphobia is also big in that that scene as well right so this whole yeah. like identity politics mm -hmm. thing became yeah. so prevalent and then going into all that and the psychology of that and how I think personally destructive it is to, um, you know, kind of identify yourself as a victim based on your identity and the kind of culture war that was happening mm -hmm. around that, but then also like realizing the legitimacy of people's experiences mm -hmm. dealing with homophobia, transphobia, yeah some racism and it really it, it is uh stuff that kind of becomes a pressure cooker for people and and makes them fear for their lives so it's very real on both sides right this like fear mm -hmm. that um fear for our lives and that's kind of creating that culture war right mm -hmm. so yeah very very i mean i'm like am i really gonna do this but but I, I was so geeking out on it. And I was like, I have to figure this out. And and so the book really kind of portrays, it's a lot about the media because I don't know what's true actually, um, but I can put forward this kind of dichotomy that's present mm -hmm. and um, hopefully, you know, find some kind of centrism in the middle of it, some kind of sanity um, because as we've watched that 2020 election play out like Trump did not drain the swamp you know then the right's like obsessed with pedophiles you know it's like it's like a whole it's a it's a very strange it's insanity actually that's kind of what it is mm -hmm. so it's like kind yeah. of like I feel like both sides are lies and there's almost like um what there's almost like a split now between the population of people who are political and people who are just totally apathetic. And I think now there's so many more people who are just entirely apathetic after the hysteria that we went through and just how awful people were to each other who had differing points of view. So. Okay. So you're, you're kind of like the books, like documenting where like say kind of like 2020 forward, the different things that happened the different, tensions, conflicts, 
situations, the confusion, the, the different polarities. And then do you have a message or do you have a way forward that you are advocating? Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't finished writing it totally, mm -hmm. but I think the way forward is it's pretty simple, but it's more of like a peace building approach and mm -hmm. a more like really deep listening to the other mm -hmm. sides. And that's what mm -hmm. I've attempted to do in ingesting all this media okay. that normally would kind of villainize. Got um, it. And so, yeah, it, it's just, if, if anything, it's almost like it's probably going to be all right, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but but it is it is interesting. Like my mother looked me in the eye when I was talking to her about all this, and she's like, Allison, there's gonna be another pandemic, you know? And so because there's pandemics all the time. How does she know that? <laughs> well, right. I'm like, oh <laughs> World Health Organization. <laughs> um, but you know, it's interesting because it's like, what is this next black swan event? Um, I've heard people from who like work in government pretty high up in the more like right wing so like associations say like the u.s is already under attack from china it's like mm -hmm. our like you know like what what is it mm -hmm. so um i i really just for my little computer researcher bystander i i don't know it but mm -hmm. um but i think that the more we can empty our minds of these i call them like viral ideologies that we mm -hmm. do to explain our suffering probably the happier we'll be in the easier it will be to get along with our neighbors yeah. because like these ideologies that create war mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, an interpersonal mm -hmm. conflict. So, so yeah. kind of like helping people to understand where the other side's coming from to kind of like kind of humanize the other side definitely seems like a good starting point. Yeah, I mean, sure. a book can only accomplish so much. Yeah. If I do that, that's yeah, pretty good, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find interesting too is like, you know, the media always makes everything binary, like there's two sides, and then perception creates reality, so it does kind of become the way of things. But there's actually like a lot of sides. You know what I mean? There's a lot of different ways to look, and there's a lot happening. I think it's. And then the sides can be different depending on the particular issue. It's actually pretty fascinating and interesting. And I know you and I had some conversations about this over the years. Um, so that can be helpful too of like, okay, this is, this is us. And on every issue, we're like this. And these are the evil people on every issue. And it's like, when you start talking to people, people aren't that black and white. You know, there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of diversity of way people look at things and feel things um so that i think that's that's interesting too to kind of like you know even there's even divisions um within the republican party divisions within the democratic party um yeah culturally there's different phenomena i was talking to this um this woman from from italy today and she was saying how she wanted to her dream is to come visit america and like you know i was talking about some events i was doing and stuff here but but she was talking about she wants to come to and her dreams come to america and i said yeah it's, it's come it's it's so fun right now everyone's fighting it's great you know and i was joking but it actually you know if you can just kind of like step back like it is very interesting you know, like people can can be really freaked out in that kind of existential, like uh, fight or flight thing. But I like when you said it's all going to be all right, because it's like, yeah, we're like we're moving through something that's going somewhere, you know, and just kind of just kind of like having that perspective, I guess it's kind of like the long the, the larger view, the meta view perspective, which is probably part of the problem, actually. Cause it's like America is like, everything is like, like the whole world is like four years now. You know what I mean? Where maybe more like the indigenous approach of like, maybe more like 700 years, you know, looking at things from that perspective would be, would be much more helpful for us. But um, anyway, 
yeah i i travel a lot not when i one yes time I, you do uh, i was talking to someone there and he was like he he basically said to me he's like i think america is where all these social issues are actually going to get resolved for the rest of the world because mm -hmm. i almost like the throat chakra of the planet mm -hmm. right because like americans feel so right. entitled to our first amendment right, right. and we're all um you know, we're, we're pretty well educated comparatively. So we're mm. able to kind of form these abstract thoughts and we fight online. We all have access to the internet, all these different reasons why kind of this hashing out that we do that is not exactly comfortable, although it is fascinating <laughs> to mm. study. Um, perhaps there are ripple effects that happen where we are in some ways like creating cultural um creating cultural trends mm -hmm. through this processing that we do out loud with each other what about social media like i think there's a sort of a consensus i don't know what your opinion is but i'm hearing a lot of people kind of coming to this realization that social media has been kind of a bad thing in many ways for our discourse and the way we see each other interact with each other what's your feeling on that uh, I was just reading a Substack, which I'm now on Substack too. Um, I my name of my uh, publication is Culture Wars to kind of talk okay. about. Um, but anyways, I was on Substack and I started reading an article from a man who was talking about the state of the culture, and he was saying that culture used to be art and entertainment, mm. and now it's barely any of those it's really just about distraction and that distraction takes on a form of dopamine addiction and that yeah. like our culture has become like this this dopamine fuel this is how we're getting our information um and that that it's just so much of the content that's out there is not actually it's degenerating culture essentially. yeah it's like degenerating yeah. relationships it's um degenerating our attention spans and and you know sometimes I personally question if I still want to write books because I feel like the attention spans of people are so short I'm just writing to myself yeah. Yeah. um because it's just not that type of like investigative journalism or yeah or ways that people just gathered information in the past and these more slower slower ways of being um it's just it's just no more right and right. so like, I, I wonder if these things have become, are becoming like lost art forms in a way. And social media is definitely the reason behind that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, and, on, and on another level, it does give everyone a platform to share their voice, right? Which also allows these conversations to be had, right? So I don't know, it's kind of like anything, a double-edged sword in, in my mind, but... Yeah, it, like definitely you can see, I, I can see like these mind viruses. <laughs> it's how I see them is through social media in many ways and right. how engage and what they're posting and what um, aspects of the human condition they're kind of appealing to for their own, the building of their own empire, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's pretty low. It's pretty base level by and large. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's, I think maybe it's already happening. If it's already happening, if there's going to be a, a counter movement to this where it's more like people, let's, like I, I can envision this, I can almost like feel this counter movement of like, okay, this is going a bad direction and let's like spend more time talking to each other. <laughs> spend, let's spend more time being in the forest. You know, let's spend more time reading books. Let's spend more time, you know, in out the bonfires and, you know, in getting into the body. And I I feel like, 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 and the, the thing is, you won't see it in the media because the media wants more of your attention. So it's not going to be able to really, really reported necessarily. So it's an interesting thing. But I, I do feel like, I guess in the conversations I'm having, People are like, whoa, we're, we don't want to go into some kind of technocratic control grid. You know, we, we actually want to like be human and, you know, connect with each other on a human level and community and, you know, decentralization. 
feels like there, there there's something happening that I think I know you've been thinking about these kind of inquiries as well. Yeah, that's another kind of aspect of things that makes this time period different. Um, is this AI, this yeah. kind of explosion, this whole, if, you know, the conspiracies are like, this is how they're going to get us to turn into robots. And mm -hmm. Well, but they do talk openly about, there are the transhumanists, you know, um, got the guy's name. It's, there's several people that are quite, even Elon Musk, you know, he has the idea of the, what's that thing that goes in your brain? Neuralink. Neuralink. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, you see these things and you're like, okay, these are trends that are happening. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's yeah. Very, well, more interesting is like how they convince us to, to get on board. Yeah. Right? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure like what I see is there's always polarization, right? Sure. Whatever. Um, the opposite is all is going to simultaneously uh, rise and force alongside whatever movements happen. Yeah. So like, yeah. So the as things intensify on on one side, it can kind of create the catalyst for something to rise on the other side. So, so something that would be more, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing something that's more, it's funny. Cause it's like, it's almost like it's going back in a way, but it's like going forward, you know, but it's like connecting to, I mean, just basic things like connecting more to nature, connecting more to other human beings, connecting with each other. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if the word organic, you know, like an organic way of, of living. Yeah, well, I got my overalls on over here. <laughs> what? So I, I, I'm trying it, but I'll tell you the simple life is, is complicated too. Uh -huh. All this work on the land and so, you know, you, like I idealized it and I dreamed about it. Uh -huh. Like, this is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, but um, but I think that's what I saw the most during that time period of 2020 to 2022 was that the polarization was so high, like mm -hmm. in a single way mm -hmm. that this population could be split, like yeah. voices were arising, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's like what type of medicine you believed in, um, you know, uh, backlashes against feminism, mm -hmm. uh, like yeah, the uh, the whole like Andrew Tate thing, right? Yeah, which I studied him for a while, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, he like and then these figures like Andrew Tate arise and they mm -hmm. say these very controversial things, but they're yeah. touching on pain points, right? That exist inside a large enough amount of people that they become mm -hmm. famous and um. And like you are saying, like actually the reality is like complexity and all these yeah, yeah, yeah. issues, but it seems like figures like Andrew Tate kind of like come up with one. Well, yeah, I see a couple, he's interesting in a couple ways. So, and I've talked to, my son is 22 right now and I've talked to him ex extensively and he's connected to people obviously his age. And it feels like he, there was, most, a lot of stuff's like supply and demand, right? So there was definitely this demand, like, um the me too movement started out really doing a really you know important thing and then it kind of went into some other areas that were not positive for anybody i feel like um and you know the patriarchy and all of this stuff there is a sense of like young men they just they weren't they, they weren't having any kind of a avenue to step into their masculinity basically and they were being told that was bad, that that was, you know, that's shouldn't be aggressive. You shouldn't be competitive. You shouldn't be assertive. All these things are bad. Um, and then this guy comes out and he's saying, no, it's, it's good to be masculine. But then he's taking it in a very kind of unconscious, immature. He's not he's not a mature man. You know, he's not a mature masculine man, but he is a masculine man. So, and I think the other part where social media comes in is he's saying things that are really provocative and really like sensational and really um, kind of like, um, I noticed the things that go viral are usually things that upset people. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? It's not usually things that make people feel, sometimes it is, but more I'd say percentage is pe things that upset people or enrage people. So he's upsetting people and enraging people. And then he goes viral and it becomes this viral sensation, which is kind of the way to become a viral sensation. If you're kind of like, if you don't have a, a positive, like if you don't care morally and you just like, I just, how do I get attention? I would tell someone be really, you know, upsetting and enrage people and you'll get lots. That's, that's what Trump does. He, that was his way of kind of like getting on the, getting on the map as far as the presidential candidacy. So my sense of Andrew Tate is like, he was saying, he was pointing at something that, that really resonated with young men. Um, and I, as I'm talking to the young men, they're, they're kind of realizing now that, okay, but he was also not a conscious mature version of what we're going for. And there are mature conscious versions that we can, that we can aspire to beyond that. Yeah. You know, the whole sex <laughs> trafficking accusation is when I started to, you know, it, well, he was so interesting, right? Because he's preaching. I, I agree with you completely that mm -hmm. there's this um, demoralization mm -hmm. of men and masculinity mm -hmm. that's taken place. And it's almost like, it, it's very challenging. I, I still like grapple with it myself around you know, what does it mean to be masculine or mm. what does it mean to be feminine? And, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Andrew Tate, while he does sometimes speak of things almost like Jordan Peterson of like this moral backbone and returning mm. traditional roles that actually yeah. have some kind of sanctity yeah. Yeah. to them, there's also this other like weird toxic masculine, I guess you could yeah. call it, you know, message that he's giving, which yeah. is like, you know, start a webcam ring with all the girls that you seduce. Yeah. And I think he was like found not guilty for the trafficking. But then, you know, that's like where the female pain body really comes in around masculinity is like, hey, we're being like raped and sold and, and, you know, oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's, it's weird. It's like, okay, he's this voice. Um, for these men who are now feeling oppression and uh, particularly probably inside of romantic relationships where they feel like they're losing power or who they are is being. Um... I think it's, I think it's deeper than that. So I think I, I, I like, I resonate with what you're saying. And I think you you brought up a good point in my mind. So there's all these studies right now that show like the younger generation, like twenties, What's the younger generation called? What are they called? Your generation Gen Z. Gen Z. I would know that. I would, Gen Z. I would know that. So they're having um, less sex. They're they're let they're more single. Um, they're more like lonely and depressed. This is for both men and women, but it's even more so for the men. Interestingly, you know. So I think that you have a lot of these young men. They don't have any sex. They don't have any girlfriend. They're watching porn. They're playing video games and they're kind of upset about it. You know, and that's to me, you have to take responsibility within yourself. But for it, the point is they're upset. And then they find this guy that's like, yeah, I have lots of sex and, you know, I'm, my life's awesome. And here's how you do it. So, so they don't know any better. So they they gravitate toward that because they don't have that in their life. And again, you know. Some of the stuff he's saying will work, but it's not going to get you a mature, uh, conscious, loving, intimate relationship that you ultimately want. Yeah, I have a friend who we always talk about patriarchy stuff, mm -hmm. and um, he said something to me. I thought it was really interesting. He's like, women can complain all they want about patriarchy, but the patriarchy is instilled because women are hypergamous. Right. And so it's like the fact that like a douchebag like Andrew Tate can slay like any woman mm -hmm. because he has muscles, because he has money, mm -hmm. because he's like portrayed himself as being yeah. like, you know, alpha status. Yeah. That's why men want to be like him. Yeah. Because that's who gets that's who gets attention yeah. from women. Right. So yeah. and, and it's a very deep thing. Like our friend uh, Alicia Deva you know, has this theory too, that it's just throughout the however many years, 4,000, 5,000 years that patriarchy has been a social construct, that women are just, our sexuality is like totally wired that way. And, 
And that's just, that's what we want. Like we, we are only attracted to a very small percentage of the men out there and the average man just feels totally invisible. Well, how are they going to combat that by like going to Andrew Tate's little university you know <laughs> right so so, um, so it's it's interesting it's it's all interesting and i find all this stuff really fascinating uh -huh. to analyze so uh -huh. it's good because this is part of the culture war so it's very yeah. interesting yeah so, like understand both sides of it so i think another you brought another good point in my consciousness about andrew tate so yeah so his message is if you want to get you know, a hot girl, then like, you got to have a lot of money. You got to have a lot of material things. That's, that's what really matters. Don't listen to the, the bullshit. It's all fake, like money, material things. That's what's going to get you um, a woman. So again, there's there, that's a part of the equation. Like there's something there that's, that's true. Science would support that, but there's um, something higher, uh, which is the spiritual component, which is like, he's been missing, you know, and I actually have the book here somewhere. We're, the, ma the men's mastermind group that I'm leading, we're reading um, Way of the Superior Man by David Data, reading a chapter a week. And I hadn't read that book in a long time. So I'm kind of looking at it in a way, almost like a little bit fresh from where I am now. And he's really putting the emphasis on the what attracts a woman to a man being his presence. In other words, when he's present, when he's fully here in the moment, when he's really attentive, I think those other things are components like, you know, the man is like this, the, the sense of um, uh, provide and protect and that kind of a thing. Right. But I think, especially if it's a woman that's on a spiritual path, like the material things and the money is not going to be the most important thing. I think it's a factor, but the most important thing will be, his presence and his um, attentiveness and his integrity and, you know, honesty and uh, sense of humor and um, sense of purpose. That's a big one. Um, so those are things that I think that, that he was, he was, was lacking in his message. Um, but he touched that, that particular nerve that, that those young men were missing and got the, you know, connected and hooked them in. Yeah, and it goes into this whole Me Too thing as well of this like predatorial, I guess you could say like aspect of masculinity, like this predator prey type. I don't, I it's it's hard to, but to me, Andrew Tate really kind of like embodies a little bit of that predator energy, mm -hmm. um, which like the feminism is all angry about, right? And mm -hmm. and in many ways, like rightfully so, but um, but like. Yeah, it's um, it, it's all things I'm still sorting through. But I think I, I have heard Andrew Tate speak on videos like since his whole arrest. And he does actually seem to be kind of mellowing out. I heard that he's going in a better direction lately. He's going in a better direction. <laughs> so to me, it's like the pendulum swings, right? Uh -huh. And um, when it swings far, we get to see kind of these uh, flaws in our thinking and flaws in our conditioning and flaws in our patterning and people like him get to be the kind of cultural um, scapegoat, but, but really like his cognitive distortions exist inside of so many people. Right. Yeah. So, that's, yeah. that's, that's interesting things. So that's, I think that's interesting. Whoever your person is that you, you know, you think is some kind of dark force on the planet, whether, you know, Trump or um, Tate or whoever the other people are, um, there's many of them. The I think the interesting question is, many people are resonating. So that's the more interesting because that's just one person. But when you have millions of people that are resonating with a message or what's putting out, that's more interesting. Like, why are people resonating? There's something. In other words, there's something. There's something. I don't know what you'd call it. Something that that they find valuable there right or else they wouldn't be paying this person attention and you know engaging on such a um so much of their time yeah with tate i think it was just this rampant kind of feeling of emasculation amongst men and he was combating it and being mm -hmm. like that's the enemy like mm -hmm. 
that right and um yeah. and i and for me he woke me up because i'm like oh this guy triggers me you know, so, you know, so now i have to do all this work around like removing my enemy out picturing of him uh -huh. because he's just like a dude right uh -huh. online who i'm never gonna meet uh -huh. um, yeah and he he really brought more of this victim perpetrator thing uh -huh. right yeah so so yeah it was like he's he's pointing to a pain an aspect of the male pain body that mm -hmm. needs uh right. healing right yeah, needs tension right needs balancing out mm -hmm. so and andrew tate did that for us thank mm -hmm. you Andrew. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's interesting too it's sometimes it seems like like maybe like a year ago the energy of the gender war aspect of the whole cultural um cultural battling that's happening seemed much more high like it was peaking and then I could almost feel pretty energetically sensitive I could feel like when it just dropped out you know like I could feel when it was like this is just dropping out and then people it drops out because people stop talking about it like people stop paying attention to it and then the uh, I guess you could say like the hook or the control it has on us seems to almost completely disappear um it's very interesting racism i think is a very similar uh topic to like the gender stuff too because that was so up in the collective it almost made you feel like we were still in the 1940s right like of how much racism exists mm -hmm. in the u.s and you know the media makes you feel like there's like lynchings happening every day and the kkk is like headquartered everywhere i'm, I'm sure there's some KKK people out here in Marshall like so but it's good but it's real right it's there um and for some of us um it's so interesting too because I have some friends who are black and they're like I don't experience racism that much and then others it's much more insidious and I sometimes wonder if it's almost like karmic for certain souls like certain souls come in and they have deeper amounts of these patterning and wounding that they have to work through and and yeah it, it's um I started reading this book called the war on the west and in it he kind of talks who's the about, author I, I'd have to look him up but it's okay. a great book and I would totally right. uh, recommend it because he does kind of dissect actually the events of 2020 mm -hmm. and beyond from a conservative lens but it's very not conspiratorial but his whole Thing is that there's actually like a war on western culture happening mm -hmm. and that the radical left is uh using identity politics as a way to kind of dismantle the constitution and and um demonize western civilization when actually there are very there are a lot of virtues to it as well and a lot of freedoms that it has provided the world um i always think it's strange when um not even strange like comically hypocritical when feminist women are like really against the West and against like America. So like try living in Saudi Arabia for a few weeks, you know, see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, our friend Kara is in Egypt. Egypt right yeah. Now, yeah. And she, you know, she'll call me and she'll be like, you can complain all you want. <laughs> you try living under radical Islam. <laughs> <laughs> you know she's like there is no platform like well there you go no that's freedom. my point right. that's and, my point and this is also part of this culture a global culture war around religion around all these things that are happening um even what you could say what's happening in israel right now could be also interpreted as this kind of like war over western culture because israel is the one kind of democratic western country in all of the Middle East, right? Um, I've always wondered, I'm like, why does the US like have such a deep alliance with Israel? Um, and you know, there's the Holocaust and other things like that. But for whatever reason, we do live on a planet where we definitely like fight and destroy each other based on belief and identity. Um, mm -hmm. And like how that all factors into like political power, right? Mm -hmm. And these like structures of society and, and radical islam is yeah. definitely one of them right that's yeah well i i think that i guess my point is like being in when you're an american and you're living in america and you're not 
you don't travel much or maybe you don't travel at all. You travel very little. If you do travel, you're going to like some Cancun or whatever, where it's the same thing, basically. Um, like, I think having some perspective, you can, you can kind of lose perspective and you can lose appreciation. And you just think America is just this, this horrible, horrific, terrible place, you know? And um, I mean, we're, we're part of the human condition. So the human condition is tough. It's a, it's a tough journey we signed up for, but I think it is valuable to kind of tune into some other places and it gives you perspective on appreciating some things of, of your own life. You know, that would be helpful for people. That was a trend mm -hmm. I definitely saw after the events of COVID and all of that. Is yeah. that I, I found like, I saw like way more people being like, actually like, this place isn't so bad. We don't need to dismantle it to the very ground. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in the book, The War on the West, he talks, he divides it into like the identity politic mm -hmm. camp and mm -hmm. the nationalist camp, mm -hmm. which Trump very much signifies the nationalist camp. And those mm -hmm. are people who kind of have a sense of pride and pride of country, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and I saw a lot of people start to realize how uh how much privilege we have here. Yeah. How it's not as bad as these people are yeah painting it out to be so yeah yeah like when i if i tune into the media this includes alternative media it's pretty much all like just how horrible america is right now and how you know it's all negative about the state of america right so i've been thinking about this i'm looking at this like border crisis on the southern border right and i'm like okay well if it's so bad and why are all these people like sacrificing their lives to try to get across the border? Like thousands, thousands of people every day. Like, you know what I mean? It doesn't kind of like add up. Like if it's so bad, then like everyone seems to want to come here. Not everyone, but many people seem to want to want to come here. And I'm even talking to like I mentioned someone earlier, like some people talking to other countries are like, we want to move to America and how can we do it? And so it's interesting. I think we, we've kind of lost some perspective, you know, about. um just what what we have compared to other parts of the world and i think that alone could be helpful you know for americans yeah yeah it's um it's funny because like one of the reasons why i do feel compelled to write this book is because i published my last book when i was 29 mm -hmm. uh, i'm 36 now and mm -hmm. i very much like was in those uh yeah, me too. Those kind of thought patterns, yeah. right? And in many ways, that is a product of almost higher education is that yes. they build these thought yes. patterns, which is also like part of this yeah. culture war against yeah. like the education system yeah. and that it's like liberal indoctrination, right? Yeah. And it teaches you to yeah. hate your country. It teaches yeah. you to feel like a victim based on your identity. It, it, mm. it, it teaches these ways of thinking and it's interesting. I started like mentoring a young um, person and he's very much like in that radical left way of thinking. And I'm just like, this is just, <laughs> this is not productive. Like it's, this is not going to help you like yeah. succeed in life. If anything, it's like depressing. I you think know? that's the key. Really it's depressing. not a recipe for success. No, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, I started like when all this stuff was happening, I always thought conservatives were just like the villains. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they're um, not as I mean, both sides are pretty illogical in a lot of ways. But um, but I started to be like, well, who's happier? And I'm like, I think these guys actually look happier. Like they have families, they have successful businesses they're not like in a complete emotional hysteria. If you like mm -hmm. trigger them by saying the wrong word, mm -hmm. um, there seems to be like a sense of acceptance with how the world works. And, and um, you know, for me too, I used to think of like the individualism of the United States mm -hmm. as being something that was uh, evil or like mm -hmm. part of the problem of why there was so much suffering. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, I never really look too much into communist countries where it's like this whole collectivism is the unifying ideal. And then it's just like everyone's poor. No one has freedom. No one can say anything. 
and and so like like the people who are more conservative minded they they're they're able to look at the individualism of the country and and deem it a virtue right and and like almost seize it to be like mm -hmm. i my fate is not dependent on those around me like i create mm -hmm. i create my own fate right mm -hmm. and that america is a country where i think people are fighting from all over the world to be here because it does provide the tools for that to be so, you know, instead of just being stuck in poverty um, under a uh, ruthless dictator, um, you know, uh, tons of the way that like tons of other countries operate. Right. And so, I, you know, the whole the whole um, that whole time has just been such a huge paradigm shift for me. I wanted to write a book because I'm like, if my lasting impact on the world or these thoughts that I thought six years ago I'm like, I don't think that way really anymore. And um, it was just like a young, I was just a younger version of myself. And it's also like part of the challenge of writing is that you're writing out and you're like printing just your your, your way of thinking. And, and that is so subject to change. So I, I think I, I'm writing this book. So I'm like, I want to be remembered as like, mm -hmm. or so like what I, how I see things now and, mm -hmm. Perhaps it's a, um, it's just a more mature perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. What have you looked at? Um, like, what's your take on like what people would consider like traditional values? I guess we could call it. Like, um, has has anything revised or shifted around that? Yeah, you know, I I kind of started to go into that a little more mm -hmm. around like, oh, we should adopt just regular gen you know like we should go back to being more gender roly or whatever and partially I think my land was that there was like a two-year period of my life where I was working in completely male-dominated industries and I was like the only woman and um I was just like dealing with a bunch of stuff because of that and that and it actually made me realize I'm like oh the sexism thing is very real still but like also doing all these masculine activities and realizing I'm like, maybe this isn't like actually what my body thrives yeah, yeah. doing, you yeah. know, and then I started to be like, well, maybe there is some kind of, um, I don't know, biological template mm -hmm. that you would, you know, and that goes into the whole gender dysphoric kind of, world where we're questioning so deeply what it even means to be male or female and if that's something that you can choose and blah 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 you know that's a whole the transgenderism thing is like a whole and the non-binary thing is a whole uh different can of worms but then i started to also see the aspects of it that are like oppressive towards women and like why um you know why maybe something maybe in between the two might be good like like a balance between the two but i think what makes america great is that you actually do have the freedom to choose whatever part of your own path works for yeah, you right so, for you, yeah. so it's like okay it's just about more so in my mind like each individual finding a dynamic yeah that, that works mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. And this whole idea of like polarity and like how for a man and a woman to thrive inside of a intimate partnership and how much like embodying certain traits that are different than each other goes into that. I don't know, um, but it's definitely food for thought. It's definitely mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, it's definitely something to consider but I I honestly maybe the biggest problem is that anyone who comes to a conclusion feels like they need to enforce it on others as the right way to live like these people online they're just like no yeah. this is it like this yeah. is the by my cord yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? that's a good point yeah 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 that's your way it doesn't need to be everybody's way yeah 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 and it's most likely probably almost assuredly not everyone else's way yeah i think the fe the fem what i see with feminism is interesting i see kind of kind of two stages like initially is like um okay so it's like this movement for power for empowerment let's say for empowerment 
And then it's like the first movement was like, basically, I, I always think of it as masculinism, not feminism. Cause it was like, we're going to do what the men do. And we can, we, you know, it's like, we want to do what the men do. And, uh, and then it was like, what I, with the circle of women that I've talked with now, pretty much universally, they're like, we don't want to do what the men, <laughs> what the men do. <laughs> we want to, the, I think the realization now is like accessing the feminine power, you know, and, and realizing that um, you don't have to have, you don't have to empower yourself by doing masculine but through the masculine qualities um, that there is a feminine power that's equally powerful than the masculine power and has its own magic and its own um, gifts to it. And I feel like that's the exploration that I feel happening now with like the women that I really um, respect and kind of like what you said, like even when I, in the women I'm like coaching or working with, it's like when they're really in this kind of like masculine paradigm all day, they're just like, even their bodies are like, you know, it's like, there's not like a softness and a fluidity and a, and a movement and openness. Um, so, and it just, you know, and I will say there are some women that are more, that are more masculine and that, that does work for them. But, you know, the majority of women, I think are stepping into the feminine, the feminine power and and you know yeah relaxing into that yeah it's it's interesting it's like the it's like the world the pressures of the world or whatever our um cultural attempts to solve these issues are kind of pressuring women to be more masculine and men to be more feminine but that doesn't necessarily um i don't know that's not <laughs> maybe that's not helping either uh, it it is interesting, you know, if you are if you are a single woman and you do have to provide for yourself, um, and you are in like a certain work situation. It, like for me, my first hand experience is it's really hard to like be feminine, especially if you're being like sexually harassed for being beautiful mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. pressured to sleep with your boss or you know, like like all these things right it's it's actually I, I haven't arrived at completely like what is the like the hack unless you it seems like a lot of women just like become self-employed priestesses and they're like this is how I'll stay in my power um and, but there is maybe ways of going about manifesting things or accomplishing things that don't need to be like masculine you can still be just as effective it's it's just it's just from the female perspective i do empathize with the challenge that it um that it, like how challenging it can be to like stay in that space in in the world and also like we can't use that either as an excuse right for like why we can't um just be natural inside of our selves but the, the conditionings are there and they're real and we all have to do kind of work to dismantle them so like some kind of more authentic deconditioned identity can emerge right mm -hmm. yeah i agree i mean i think that the way it would have to work is you would have to have um be in a relationship with someone be married to someone or have a boyfriend or just have some someone who's your your circle of friends or a community or someone you're paying um to take on those masculine roles so you can be in the feminine role but if you don't have anybody then yeah then you have to do it yourself yeah yeah like i've been in partnership now for eight months and i'm like oh now i can be in my feminine. <laughs> but when i'm like running my homestead all by myself and like hustling to make money you know i'm like uh -huh. You know, you and like it's not gonna work. Like I have yeah. to be like that. And then I was also yeah. noticing exactly like what you were saying, like my body stiffening and hardening yeah. up, and yeah. me getting this like attitude where I'm very angry. Yeah. You no, know? and then like yeah. I'm so interested in like this. Uh, if like I don't know how we would examine this, but the correlation between like the law of attraction and the amount of like perceived oppression that you or, or oppression mm -hmm. that you experience, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is mm -hmm. it like a vibrational, like, do you, can we vibrate beyond 
these paradigms inside of a country mm-hmm. like this, where there's, you know, enough of the alternative, you know, there's enough like kind, decent people. And, and it go it goes on to the question you were talking about earlier. It's like, what's the point of the book? Like, what's the yeah. way forward? Like, I really just feel like we just have to treat each other as humans and yeah. stop breaking down all this stuff. And we all just want respect and mm-hmm. certain decencies. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm I'm so curious because like I went through a period where I was like experiencing so much of that. And now I haven't like had any of it for like, you know, almost a year. And I'm like, hallelujah, you know, like how do we liberate ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do we liberate ourselves from um, these dynamics? Because the reason why so many people are upset about racism and sexism and the whole left movement decolonization indigenous right like all all that stuff is because they experience oppression right Mm -hmm. because of it um but then there's other well there's another thing though that's very important to bring up yes and no i think a lot of people that i've encountered that are really into um the i don't know what to call it that are really into what you're talking about are people that are like Ivy League, like really privileged, really educated. They almost feel some kind of like guilt or shame that I, I think we've talked about this. Like that's so so they get really into like people who are oppressed because they feel bad about like their own life that they weren't oppressed or that they weren't, you know what I'm saying? I know you've I know you you know what I'm talking about. Oh, totally. But that's also mm-hmm. part of the liberal value structure, right? That's what I'm it's saying. Like- yeah, it's like we are yeah. response the anti-racism. They're like, it's your job as a white person to spend the rest of your life dismantling systemic racism. You're like, whoa. It's almost <laughs> like you're I mean, honestly, it's almost <laughs> like your your life is like too boring. Like if you just grow up and you're like wealthy and I mean, I know you grew up in a pretty wealthy family, right? So I can ask you this question, right? So if you grow up and like you're like pretty wealthy and you're in really nice like suburbs and, you know, the lawns are all cut and and then like it's almost like you need something you need something more. And it's you know what I mean? It's like I, I think that we and I'm kind of thinking it through as I'm talking. It's like I think that we need to be challenged. Like we do need a certain amount of adversity to like grow and to learn and to evolve and to awaken. And so like, if we don't have that, we'll kind of like try to live it through other people and like find some other groups that we, you know, we can like, kind of like be a part of their journey. And then also, and also there's, there's the whole thing of like feeling, this is actually really important. Like it's not really talked about, but there's so much shame and guilt happening for white people, people of European descent right now. And it's not healthy to feel guilt guilt and shame, at least not for any kind of prolonged period of time. It's very, it's, it's not healthy for anybody, including people you're relating with, interacting with. Um, so that's an interesting phenomenon too, that's not really like talked about, but it's not good. Yeah, that was one of the paradigm shifts, I think, too, I went through during that period where I was like, you know, I would always like be shamed for being privileged and whatnot, Mm -hmm. and very much like devoted the majority of my career efforts towards like helping disadvantaged. That's what I'm saying. Disadvantaged populations. (laughs) And I'm like, you know, and then it's like, you're still hated and you're the reason (laughs) why. And then you're like... I like barely make enough money <laughs> to survive because all I do is like try to solve someone else's problems and 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 you know um working in the addiction recovery field uh-huh. or anyone who works in the mental health field will tell you like there are people who just come from like so like have every resource and they flounder and they never get better and they you know so like how much of uh our success and failure is based on our own, like, like some aspect of our inner constitution, right? Like some yeah, element of fortitude for sure. or yeah. uh, resilience or mm-hmm. optimism or being able to just like be someone that 
people enjoy being around no matter yeah. how much trauma you've had to endure or whatever you know and and i think that um like like privilege very well might be part of the coin of why some people fail and some people s- succeed but it's it's certainly not the determining factor. Like in, in my experience, it has something way more do, to do with some kind of like spirit that's inside of you and mm-hmm. um, whatever drive you have. And I guess, you know, I guess like America's a place where if you bring that forward day after day and work your ass off that, you know, you can really like in one generation, like totally change you, your family's Mm -hmm. circumstances right yeah so it's interesting so I also like stopped with the whole charity thing I like I stopped with it because I realized it was this like deep-seated self-loathing that had been instilled inside of me that was like guiding a lot of my choices Mm -hmm. they're like you know go woke go broke Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's like you will like you'll just like keep giving everything you have to be um redeemed from this original sin of being like born into a white middle class family you know uh uh-huh. like like the and you're like it can never wash away. it's almost like this catholic guilt or something um but it's yeah. it's definitely it's definitely not healthy and it's interesting too because it comes into the whole socialism thing where it's like people feel like if the government just like wrote a check for everyone whether it be reparations, whether it be um, some kind of um, like safety net. I'm not saying that we don't need them, but uh, like the reality, like, like somehow. Just giving people money is going to solve their their problems. Yeah, but you're not changing like their mindset of how they'd yeah. spend it, right? Yeah. Or like, like you know, yeah. how, like, how, like that yeah. kind of stuff. So yeah. then that's what, you know, like they say, these communist countries are just like everyone's poor. Mm-hmm. Um because like the money eventually goes yeah. away. And yeah. So and- this kind of goes back to like, actually kind of circles back to the Andrew Tate point of like privilege. Privilege is like, oh, you have money and you have wealth and you have material things and you have houses and cars and, you know, vacation homes. And it's like, when I'm really like feeling into it right now, I'm like, that's okay. So I think if I would think like, what is the greatest privilege? It would be like, having parents that like really love you and like really care for you and make you a priority and be attentive to you. And like, that would be a better gauge of like a child that's going to grow up, you know, healthy and fulfilled and successful, even from like a modest income than a child that's like super duper billionaire parents that like are totally neglecting them, you know, and on drugs and, you know, whatever, not, not really present for the child. I just care about status and so forth. Yeah. I mean, I've met plenty of them too. So, right. And like very miserable people who have all those external indicators of privilege. Right. And it's just not holistic. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's everyone's journey, right? That's everyone. But I just think that's a deeper because like people will be like, oh, you're so privileged because you grew up wealthy. It doesn't mean necessarily they were privileged. That's one factor, you know, but there's a lot of, there's more essential factors that would, that would indicate privilege. And then there are people that are more privileged than other people for sure. And I think if you are more privileged, then be grateful and be appreciative, <laughs> you know, and then sure, if you can help other people uh, with, with what you have, that's, that's um that would be the ultimate the ultimate um human journey to take is to be a benefit to the to others and be a be a highest benefit to the world yeah i also don't want to come off like i'm blind to the systemic whatever you know that wouldn't that word needs to go through with a fine tooth comb around Mm. like how much of this civil rights stuff has been dismantled how much of this like poverty is like systemic and in a loop Mm. You know, I'm sure there's tons of statistics that say like, you know, most people don't make it out of the hood or 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 whatever, right? Like I'm not trying to be like because I think when I when I started going through this swing of examining the other side, I, I got a little maybe a little numb to the to the 
hardships that uh, others that I used to be so like engulfed in being like a savior to save. And I think that's actually what makes people hate the right so much is that they almost like, it feels like they're gaslighting all of the, uh, like people who don't have it so good and kind of like hold on to the left as like the good guys that are going to do things to help their situation in this country. Um, they kind of make it seem like, oh, all your trauma is your fault, right? Or, or, or this doesn't exist. It's all in your mind. But you know, what we saw like during Me Too, when all the women are coming forth with their like horror stories of being assaulted or for Black Lives Matter, where you hear all this like horrible like all these like hor this horrible violence that the black community experiences and and that like racism is real and you know all that stuff is it's still here um i i just don't want to come off like i'm insensitive to that because i i definitely acknowledge it i just um i i i don't know i would love to i would love to find a way forward that is balanced in those two perspectives because just learning to balance them myself through the process of writing this book like has helped me become a better person right mm -hmm. and not be victim to my own kind of like swinging around my worldview that um traps me in a box right yeah. right that yeah. makes I think you just sense. yeah I think you just answered the question like so I think like having compassion and empathy for others is like always important you know and you know, we don't, we, I guess like humility of like, we haven't completely walked in someone else's shoes. Right. So that there's that component. And then it's like, okay, so someone's in a really um, difficult situation and they grew up in that situation. And like, what's the way out of that situation? That's the important question. Right. And I think it's pretty clear that like being in a victimization consciousness is not going to help you to get out of the situation. That's just the fact of the matter. And so your story, what you're telling me is like me shifting that consciousness is like improving my life and opening me up to different, different, different um, levels. And I think that that's universal. You know, that's a universal story around the world, no matter what your color is, your gender is, your orientation that's a universal truth. And also, you know, sometimes people have healing that they need to move through first before they're ready to take that step. And so, you know, have it, we have need of empathy for that as well, compassion for that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe resources for that too. Right. But um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely feel like I'm dead in the center now, as far as my political I, I see both sides very clearly and I see the um, mm -hmm. the logic in both sides, yeah. the, the need for both sides. And my understanding is that America um, was created so that both of those sides could balance each other out mm -hmm. inside the led, like the legislative mm -hmm. congressional mm -hmm. progress. But what we have is a culture war instead mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. um, where not much gets done because mm -hmm. they view the other as the problem right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so in my own little inside my own soma i have attempted to make peace and hopefully to whatever extent that this be, book you feel called to be a to be a messenger of a bridge between the two between the divide yeah because i had to do it with my parents you know um with everything that happened and like 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 humanizing them you know um it's it's not easy like having people say you know your parents are involved in like a the engineering of a global holocaust like that's like not easy to go through mm -hmm. and then like in my like in my and this is the first time i've ever publicly spoken about this um but yeah, like it, and like, and then I'm at the kitchen table. And my mom's like screaming to deploy like millions of vaccines to Africa to save people's lives. She's like, Allison, there's like 
they're burning bodies on the street of China. Like four million people have died. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, why don't you believe this is a big thing? You know, like that whole perspective mm -hmm. of the experts. And like, I promise mm -hmm. you, my father knows so much more about vaccines than like almost anyone on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like he knows about vaccines. But like in my heart, I'm like, this doesn't resonate with me. You know, like I don't necessarily like this doesn't add up for me, but like to 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 like really see where they were coming from and to make peace with that. And then for them to have to make peace with me that I don't see it that way. Um, and we're still family. Right. Because it was so intense that mm -hmm. that. um you know, families were breaking apart. Yeah. Like it was tearing apart, like families and friends and you had to pick a side. And if you yep. were side was this side, then you would hang out with other people who saw the world your way. And the whole thing was just so fascinating and how we all thought the other person was like going to kill us if they thought differently. But in the reality, like it wasn't even that big of a, deal you know mm -hmm. like we all created this giant um kind of like battle between each other that never needed to be there but like it was there because the media you know yeah it. that's what i was gonna ask is like how much of this is like like genuine and how much of this is like intentionally created by other forces that have their own agenda to keep people divided and and separate yeah, I mean, my father and I was showing it to him. He, I'm like, Dad, I'm not picking sides. Like, I'm not gonna like do that to the family. Like, I really like am honored to be a member of the family and that you guys have accomplished so much. But, um, but yeah, my dad was just like, fifty percent of this book should be about the media. He was like, because that, like that in and of itself. Like he was like the PR that happened, like while we were trying to like globalize a response to mm -hmm. this. And, you know, I showed them all the things about like gain of function research mm -hmm. and uh, the event 201. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's like an extent that they're like, you know, they, but you can always show another article saying that that's not true. So it's like the way it's very hard to piece together, like what is true, because the media has one side and it's like, this is a whistleblower and this is, um, this is the truth. Right. And then there's censorship happening and like all, you know, everything that we went through. Um, but then there's also going to be like a CNN article, right. About how that's not true. And, and so I, I kind of like feel less, um, less, uh, less inspired to figure out the truth and and more inspired to just kind of showcase how the how the media uh, works to manipulate manipulate our emotions and like manipulate um our affiliations right like like insights mm -hmm. or affiliations and I've talked to a lot of people they're like I like my only way of kind of rising above what we all what all happened and i think we haven't even had the conversation that we're having right now largely it was like we just went through this giant very yeah people seem to just be kind of like not wanting to deal with it yeah they're like it's over we yeah. don't have to wear a mask <laughs> we like the business they're like shut up they're like, <laughs> like, like just like don't talk about it it's like it never happened right we're like yeah <laughs> we're like two years and we were awful you know yeah like it was we were really bad to each other there was like a the psychological term is like splitting right you're splitting yeah. into black and white thinking and um and and i do think that maybe there is something in the collective that would benefit from having conversations it almost feels like people have given up and people are like the only way i can handle this is to kind of like vibrate beyond even like giving a caring anymore about politics or like because like it was like both sides like the wool was just like over our eyes on both sides like the lies from both sides it's it's just it was like wow like this was a giant I think it was a sigh you know like it was a giant psyop but it wasn't as 
crazy as these conspiracy people were making it out to be the whole Q thing, the whole, you know, all that stuff was, you know, not true. And it's just so interesting how, how, um, yeah, people just like latch on to these things. And I think there has been this kind of mass, uh, like just forget about it. And also just being like, I'm not going to even pay attention anymore because this is uh, damaging, right? This is like mm -hmm. damaging mental health. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm interested to see how this next election, like the fervor and if people are just going to be like, eh, it doesn't really matter who's president anyhow. <laughs> you know, like are you really seeing that? Because I'm <laughs> seeing like people are like, this is the end of the world. Whatever <laughs> happens here is like, <laughs> the universe is going to collapse. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they thought that with Biden, like, it's fine. Like, in some ways, like, I don't know. I think there's been more sense of peace under Biden interpersonally um, because Trump just does something. I mean, it's the media's per portrayal of him, but it's also him. Like, he really just pisses people off, right? And mm -hmm. he really creates a, a deep amount of social division and unrest. And um, it's been nice to have four years, like, away from that. Um, I don't know. I'm interested to see. I'm and that's kind of part of like why I'm waiting to release the book until the election because it is going to also like bring in some of the more current stuff and and this is really like the continuation of that. Uh, maybe maybe what it is is maybe people aren't maybe some people aren't apathetic. Maybe they're realizing that politics or who's the president of the United States is not the ultimate solution to their problems and that everything's not going to be solved through politics, which, so maybe it's like actually a, a what I would say is a good thing of realizing that, um, yeah, that, that, that's not, you know, you know, you know how you're saying there's this idea that like, Oh, Donald Trump's the savior. He's going to like save us. Or I don't, I don't think anybody thinks Biden's the savior, but, <laughs> but whoever you think is your political person, that's going to like save you. Or it's like, maybe people are realizing that like, that's, that has its place. Of course, that makes a difference in the world on some level, but there's other ways beyond that to positively uh, shift your own personal life and, and the world be the be that I guess the saying you know to quote Gandhi be the change you want to see in the world maybe there's more of a real, realization of of that element yeah or just like how do you be happy right like, right I know that might sound trivial but it's also like not that pretty important to, yeah you know yeah. It's, yeah it's like oh well now we have a black female vice president so like no it's okay right you know like <laughs> like no, it's yeah, like it's all another way to outsource power, right? Like outsource personal power. Mm -hmm. Um, I I personally don't think it matters too much, but it's very interesting. Like on both sides, if you're like like hardcore left or hardcore mm -hmm. right, the the inner monologue right now is that this is the election that determines like the universe. The America. yeah like our democracy like yeah. from the, like our democracy is totally at stake like uh -huh. if he wins and then on the right they're like our democracy is totally well, you know i think i think okay i do think that what could be very problematic and is actually quite possible uh, either direction is that people lose trust in presidential elections and they lose trust in the in the you know the 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 what would you call it the like the fiber of the process itself that would be a problem and it does seem like the, a lot of people are trending that direction yeah yeah because there, I mean, there are a lot of countries like that I mean you can see those countries where everyone knows that the election is a sham and no one trusts it and it's like there's just like these kind of like an oligarchy behind the scenes that's doing what they want for their own benefit and the media is fake and like that's that would be the danger um and um something to be mindful of yeah i mean i i personally don't know how to engage with the voting process too much you know i try to do my duty and i like go to the ballots and mm -hmm. i'm like see a bunch of random names and like i'll even spend like hours researching these mm -hmm. candidates and their platform but all i see mm -hmm. is like a website you know, 
by them <laughs> saying who they are. And I'm like, I don't actually have any idea. Yep. But here I am, you know, yep. like, I think even in this country where we do have the, you know, right to vote, like that could be um, like one, like one site that's like publicly funded where there's a mm. bunch of media about every single topic that mm. uh, explains all the positions and the things that they're voting on and mm -hmm. behind it and things mm -hmm. like that. I feel like that would be an epic um that would be like an epic way to improve it. But like, I've always felt kind of disenchanted with the voting process, but I still try to do it because I'm like, oh, this is like, this, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then people think it's like, oh, who you pick for president is the only one that matters because it's the one that's like the most media about it for like, you know, seven months leading up to it. Right. But you mm -hmm. don't know about anybody else. Um, yeah. It's pretty interesting. I don't know, Brian. There's a lot. Well, it does seem like if you if you were someone who felt called to engage in politics in a in a deep way, I mean, the way you'd want to the way you would want to engage that would make a, to make the biggest difference for sure would be locally. It's not going to be on the presidential level, you know. I think that that's that feels pretty <clears throat> clear to me. But I wanted to um, bring one other thing forward. I think it's it's very something that I think a lot of people it's made a lot of people cynical. Um, and I think for good reason. So a lot of the, so you kind of, these multinational corporations, um, they're, it's in their bylaws to maximize profits. Right. And so what, what's happening now is they've realized that it's beneficial for them to maximize profits, to push various, or even sometimes even create kind of social justice issues. I think like the the covid thing it's usually they'll they'll take some like they'll really push that group that's like with the covid thing it was like grandmothers and grandfathers oh you're killing the the grandparents and you know all this kind of thing so they always have some group that um like is the oppressed group that they're helping and if you kind of look deeper it's almost always like those are the same families that have made those people oppressed to begin with that now claim that they're helping the people who are oppressed and give them money and they're maximizing profits. It's like they're making money on both sides of it, you know? So I, I do see this with the pharmaceutical industry. I see this with like the social justice industry. I see this with the defense industry and you can name other industries too, right? But I think that's something that's, I think it's like the culture war would be one thing if it was like a genuine, you know, like this starts, but it's not even like genuine. A lot of times it's like, people are just saying things to manipulate the public to, you know, and then that turns people off to social justice um, causes that they could be, I would say for myself, like I don't trust any of the social justice institutions because of the, the money that they're, that who funds them and what they're, you know, what they're about and what they're trying to push. So there's kind of this, this corruption that's happening where it makes the conversation even more muddy because it's not a genuine conversation. I just wanted to get your perception on that. Yeah, that it, I, I actually wrote in the book something similar to what you were saying about this kind of like, like everything that people say that they're doing, like these institutions, like we're here to protect the peace, like the people who create the war. Like Exactly. Are That's a good example, yeah. Right, so... um. Right. It's, it's just, it's so we're going, we're going to invade this country to protect the peace there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, and terrorism is real and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's all kind of illogical. Right. And, but if there is one guiding force, that's not, um, a conspiracy, we can like clearly see that this is the guiding force principle of the flow of capital and resources it's mm -hmm. that you have to make a profit right like you have to make a profit and you have to um like the, the people who have all the wealth and the corporations like where where like money is aggregated like they have to they are the gatekeepers of mm -hmm. of like what gets funded and and then if you talk about 
if you talk about like Black Lives Matter or homophobia or transphobia or whatever else, they're all the different, th then they think you're, you're a good company, you know, you're doing good things. And it's, it's like, it's pretty obvious to me that they're, they use these things to, to continue to maximize profit and be in good favor of um, people that otherwise would definitely not be in their favor. Yeah, yeah, you know, we saw that. I think um, that was another trust, like social trend that happened during that time, whereas like previously corporations would never do anything political mm -hmm. because they would never want to alienate half of their potential mm -hmm. customer base. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden it's like you have to have, you know, a sign in your window mm -hmm. that says you're for like equal rights and mm -hmm. you support these liberal causes. Um and then meanwhile, these are the same companies that are like, you know, paying people 50 cents an hour in Africa or China to mine, you know, um, out of the ground. And it's like, it's just, it's like, it's like virtue signaling, right? Yeah. Well, it's like, yeah, we're, we know we're doing the opposite. So let's just like put this forward. And then it just, it's like I said, it, it, it really creates this kind of massive confusion about um even the having a genuine discussion about these issues because the main players aren't even authentic that are involved in it yeah um or they've convinced themselves that they're doing good you know it's 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 quite the it's quite the um like very interesting psychological processes but i i think if i could put my finger on one one thing that you're talking about that it's a hard, it's just like, it's just a confusing time. It's like, it's a confusing, like, how do we make sense of everything that happened? Um, how do we move forward? Who do we trust? Um, you know, uh, I think many of us have just kind of retreated into our own personal lives and tending to our families and our relationships and just making mm -hmm. sure our businesses are doing good or just like mm -hmm. keeping our head down with what's important. It's just, it's not all this, right? Because mm -hmm. it is people like you and me, we love to wax poetic about it and, and pick all these things apart. But it is, it is a very, very confusing time um, to just like discern, like if any social movements are even, you know, worth putting your precious time and energy and money into, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because, uh Cause it's just so hard to know what's like real and what's not. Yeah, definitely re at least, at least research who's behind them and what they're about. And um... yeah, the BLM thing was so disappointing, right? It's like, they got like what, however many million dollars. And then, you know, like. That's like, usually how it goes. And they're like, you know, really exploiting the black pain body, which is like real for real reasons. And yeah, it's just like, it's all just this, um, a rich man's trick what's that documentary it's a uh, it's all yeah it's it's just um it's it's definitely uh disheartening well you mentioned bill gates earlier i know bill gates he moved to being a philanthropist and i think he at least doubled his wealth since if not tripled his wealth since he became a philanthropist you know yeah. and, that, and, and that's a classic trick of extremely wealthy people is you know you can make more money through being a philanthropist than you can through, uh, through even, you know, um, traditional business. Yeah. At least the traditional business maybe is a little more, but I wouldn't even go that far to say it's more <laughs> straightforward, but everyone's got to make a profit, right? Cause we're living under like that is ultimate. I, I consider capitalism like the ultimate, um, structure that we're living under. Yeah, for sure globally you know yeah. um and i and i get why people ha are upset by it you know and, and yeah. would like more socialist like reform i i get it like i get i i very much get that it's just it's just a uh, challenging when like i don't know what are the examples of when that's mm -hmm. worked and not the other the other side too people will say is that we've never ha actually had free market capitalism truly like it's what they call crony capitalism you know, that's like, that's not genuinely open, um, open and fair. 
Yeah, it's so financial. There's that side of it too. Yeah. Right, it's financialism. And then you get into the whole crypto thing, right? Like the whole decentralization. Bitcoin. Coins up. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Well, we've been talking. We've for been, a while. We've been going for it. So let's uh, let's wrap it up. Um, what are your closing thoughts that you'd like to share? Oh, just I hope that I'm able to pull this off <laughs> and uh, and actually publish this book and do what it takes and then I you know say say words I mean maybe it would be better if I pissed everyone off because so then I could go viral but I I am really <laughs> trying to to do something here that's perhaps of like a higher purpose than that um yeah and then um I hope that if this interests you that you will consider reading the book when it comes out and check out my sub stack and um, culture wars right yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Allison Lee share at um that substack.com. Mm -hmm. um, for culture wars and yeah, I'm just going to do my very best to like f like find some kind of order in this chaos that I can share and um and I don't know I don't know if it's possible but I'm going to do my best. Mhm. Mm yeah. Beautiful. I I I'd like to, like to say that like I I like you know what you're saying about how it's such a confusing time and when I'm kind of in that swirl of energy around me, I, I like to come back to like, okay, what are the things that are kind of timeless that are always going to be true, you know? And it's like, love, you know, be loving, be kind, um, try to find inner peace. Um, I like what you said about like, not trying to impose your will on other people. That feels like a timeless truth so freedom i guess that would be on the realm of freedom um as best you can like being honest and telling the truth and operating from integrity as best you can and sharing your gifts with the world yeah this yeah. was why i was on such a debate of whether or not to like go forward with this because everything that you're saying is like that's what i've been focusing on the past few years and i'm like this is this is way better than like yeah, being but... in the swirl, you know, it's like way better than being in the swirl, but there is like an aspect. I just had this nagging thing where like, this is an aspect of sharing my gift. So, um, I'm just yeah. Gonna go well, I think what my understanding, my sense of what you're doing is you're intending to bring that into the swirl mm -hmm. to de-swirl it a bit. <laughs> Cause I think the swirl is happening because people have lost that, mm -hmm. that, um, access that center point inside themselves and so if we could bring that those values like into those conversations they could take a whole different quality and be actually quite generative and creative and you know can find positive solutions and realize that i think anytime there's like a polarity i don't think you can have a polarity without both sides having some value you know there's something in there especially if you have millions of people that are like really you know, adamant and passionate about one particular side, there's, there's something there that has value and it's like integrating the two then. Right. So it feels like that's the, the mission you're on, which feels like a noble, a noble mission. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks everybody for listening and uh, see you in the next now. <laughs>